Hi and welcome to Magic Numbers. This is episode 28 and today we're going to be talking about Neo forms and we're going to explore the Kamigawa archetypes with draft data. And to start with this episode, I'm going to basically try to give you my philosophy of how I try to link my job, which is studying ecology of bacteria and tech building and using the similar tools to try to analyze the color pairs in uh, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. And after I give you the theoretical brief theoretical background, you know, don't expect an hour lecture on ecology of bacteria. I could do that, but uh, I guess my numbers wouldn't be great. Uh, but after that, I'm going to start exploring uh, the archetypist tool that um, uh, I helped um, uh, to have developed. So basically, I delivered the data to uh, Pekka Kapuli, who is um, a Finnish uh, Magic the Gathering aficionado plus a, a, a very uh, competent data uh, visualizer and uh, we're going to look at the data there you're going to learn how to explore the, the, the tool you're going to learn where to find the tool i would uh, you know it would be nice um, not to over stream it uh, with users while i'm streaming because um, i don't know what is the bandwidth that uh, pekka has um but if you have any comments on how would you think that the tool could become better, that would be great to either, you know, PM me on, on Twitter or uh, on any Discord or whatever. Um, so we can actually incorporate some functionalities for the next uh, iteration that we're going to definitely try to make. Okay, without further ado, as always, I start with my preamble. Um, and today I'm going to talk about, about Popper's Paradox, but for Magic Twitter. So Popper's paradox is this idea that uh, in a tolerant society, people that think that uh, tolerance is the enemy should be excluded from that tolerance rule. And it's the same in democracy. In a democratic country, people whose only goal is to take over the power and remove the democracy should be excluded from the democratic process because their aim is to... Uh, remove the thing that basically the society is based on. It removes the sort of pillars of the whole society and therefore there shouldn't be uh, any kind of uh, uh, acceptance for that kind of behavior. Because if you will accept it, if they take over the power, they remove the whole system, which means that the system stops being the thing that it was designed to be. And I have the same feeling about nagging about people who nag about magic. It's just Generally, I think that there's too much nagging on magic and it's counterproductive in many ways. And I think that people whose only aim is to go online and nag about what's he doing this, what's he doing that, should be treated, well, pretty badly in the, by the community because they are a massive part of the problem. I think that, you know, Watsi is a company and it has to listen to the customers and if it listens to only nagging, never hears anything you know, positive, they just lose any kind of motivation to do something useful. Also, nagging about things that are completely idiotic, like people that believe in a shuffler conspiracy, um, is detracting work from things that you know should be done. Like, Thousands and thousands of complaints on the what's on the arena website where you can report bugs uh, is dedicated to people drawing one land in the game and they say, well, that clearly shuffler doesn't work because how is it possible that I drew one land in that game? Or I drew four mountains in my deck that has mountains and swamps. How is it possible? Well, it's just statistics. I did data analysis on this back and forth and I tried it any way whatsoever. And based on hundreds of thousands of games, there's just no detraction between what you're seeing in uh, games and what you should be seeing by the laws of statistics, because on such big sample sizes, the error is pretty small. And there are probably countless examples of that and combine that with never hearing anything good. My example for this week was the results of the recent Protor, and I'm going to call it Protor, deal with it. Protor was such a good friend. But in the recent Pro Tour, the um, decks that were based on alchemy, so the modified cards, um, uh, were played. And one of the decks that was maybe not dominant in the uh, metagame, but uh, quite prominent and actually had a good win rate and everything, 
was the Venture into the Dungeon uh, White Black deck. Um, Venture into the Dungeon was a mechanic that missed even on the draft format. So uh, Venture into the Dungeon decks were just not good at all in, in Limited. It's a completely missed um, paper mechanic. But WotC decided not to give up on it and they tweaked here and there, reduced the cost here, added one power there, um, added some extra ability here. Uh, and all of a sudden decks that used it well, in some way prominently, because they most had 12 cards that uh, were dealing with venturing the dungeon, um, all of a sudden showed up and actually did well. And one of them uh, in the uh, uh, capable hands of, oh God, now I have to remember the name live and I forgot it already. I just bloody Eli Cassis, that's the one. Uh, I was listening to uh, him being on a podcast today and I already forgot the name, what, what a genius I am. Um, it won the whole thing. So they managed to tweak some parameters in the mechanic and uh, they managed to nail it and the deck became pretty powerful but not unbeatable, which is exactly where you want it to be. So basically the cards that were modified uh, are playable. The metagame is richer for that. And um, uh, and there is the uh, pro tour win uh, uh, related to that. Um, so I heard very little praise for that which is a shame because people that work on it would like to listen to some praise. I mean, I do produce content and it's nice from time to time to hear that, oh, I actually liked your article or I liked the last stream or I liked the whatever thing. Uh, and without it, I think it would be very hard to stream. Like if you would only hear, oh, that's rubbish. You made a mistake here. This slide was not clear. I didn't understand that thing. Uh, plus if you add it with the source of things that are not even to the point, and you know that people that are saying it are wrong, you just like lose any kind of interest on trying to make something that people enjoy. And I think that we might be running into this problem with WOTC. It's just like only hearing bad things and never hearing any praise is a, um, is a bad thing for the community in general. So I know it's a stereotype, but Irish people are thought to be very optimistic. Today we have St. Patrick's Day, cheers. And I think we should learn from this stereotypical non-existing Irishman to be a bit more positive about what WOTC does. And you know what? They do a lot of things wrong. I'm not going to say not, but they do also a lot of things right because somehow we're still playing the bloody game. So um, clearly there is some uh, something that is appealing to us. Give them a bit of a positive thumbs up from time to time. I'm not saying you should, you know, become their psycho fans, uh, but occasional compliment here and there Telling what is good is also a valid piece of information for them, won't hurt you. And definitely won't hurt the Twitter community, which I'm more and more disillusioned with because I just open it and I see a stream of nagging and complaining from all sides possible. So that's my thing. Popper's paradox, but in Magic Twitter, you can complain about people who complain, but try not to complain about everything. Anyway, with that, we can move on to the actual uh, main portion of the presentation. Hi, Super Gaffer. I'm not ignoring you. I just try not to do any personal things during the seminar streams, but um, there will be time for questions after that. So, uh, and when I'm exploring the data, we might have a more casual chat as well. But today I want to talk a bit about ecology and magic and my uh, philosophy on how to try to identify sub builds um, of different archetypes. So I'm an ecologist by trade, that's my job. I study bacteria interactions in complex communities. So I look at the a system with several hundred species and I try to see what happens when you manipulate it in such way or in such way. And um, uh, what happens when you blend multiple ecosystems into one and things like that. Um, it's not uh, particularly relevant to the stream. However, I'm going to describe you a bit. How does uh, uh, ecology in, in, in my version at least work? So ecology studies interaction between species in an ecosystem. An ecosystem is a very broadly defined uh, set of physical conditions where species live. And ecosystems are complex networks of multiple species, which means that there are interactions between species. Some species are synergistic, some species are antagonistic, uh, some species are neutral to each other because they occupy the same space, but not necessarily the same niches because of the size differences and things like that. Um, what is more important if you have particular types of ecosystems, uh, for example, the ones that I study, uh, you can 
ecosystem can exhibit a measurable function. In my case, I study production of biogas by bacteria from uh, uh, organic matter. So basically, you chuck in a lot of waste, bacteria metabolize it, and they produce methane. How does it work? Uh, the point is, if they don't produce methane, they basically die. Because if they don't produce methane, they accumulate acetate, which is sort of vinegar. And that drops the pH and the bacteria cannot withstand low, um, a low pH, uh, they just die. So for me, the more gas they produce, the more methane, the, the, the more acetate they remove. So it means that the community is more healthy and it's a measurable function. And I can actually link how much gas they produce with um, how healthy they are. And I base a lot of my work on, on this simple relation. Um, so by measuring the function and by quantifying it, I can assess the health of the microbial community. And by doing that, I can draw conclusions on what are the key species and what are the key interactions, because I see the changes in composition, in um, proportion of different species. Some species disappear, some species uh, thrive, and I can basically link those things to the function of the uh, ecosystem and try to uh, figure out how the biology uh, in that system works. Now, this was the super boring part about microbial ecology. Now let's move to the same part, but uh, about magic. Magic decks are interactions between cards in a metagame. So you put multiple cards into a deck, that deck will compete in a metagame. Uh, this is very similar in my head, at least to the ecosystem and species. Just replace the uh, cards for species and metagame for ecosystem, and you have basically the same definition. Decks are complex networks of multiple card types. True, if you put cards, they have a complex interaction between them. Some cards are synergistic. Some cards are pockets of synergy. Some cards are synergistic across the uh, wider spectrum. Some cards are actually not working with themselves. For example, if you play um, the Horobi saga in uh, Kamigawa, which produces the rat tokens, um, and then you get the rat tokens back, and then you play the Fall of Lord Konda on chapter number two from Fall of Lord Konda. Everyone gains control of the card they own. And the point is, of course, that uh, the actual owner of the rat tokens you created is the player that got them. So uh, you got your rat backs, uh, rats back, you play the Fall of Lord Konda, the rats are going back to the uh, person that they came into play uh, four. So uh, basically, you play this card and you sort of hose yourself uh, if you don't know that this interaction will work like that. Um, and there are many multiple examples of uh, cards that just don't work very well together. You don't want to play some kind of controlish cards in aggro decks because aggro decks should focus on killing, not on defending, because you're not very good in defending. Um, so that's like a macro mismatch and uh, whatever. Furthermore, decks can exhibit some measurable function, just like ecosystems could exhibit some measurable function. And in case of decks, that function is a win rate. And of course, win rate of a single deck maybe is not a very telling metric, but um, comparison of uh, similar decks and their win rates could be. By measuring the win rate, we can assess power of particular builds. And by looking at the composition of the decks uh, that have uh, uh, particular similarities, we can draw some conclusions on key cards and uh, key mechanisms and key pockets of synergies. So in that way, studying the metagame is actually not that very much different from uh, ecology, if you look at it from this perspective. You know, don't get me wrong, you can study limited um, uh, environment in millions of ways. Uh, you can focus on single cards, you can focus on learning by playing, or you can do what I do here. This is not the only thing I do, but uh, this is one particularly that uh, uh, very much matches what I'm doing in my real work. Okay, so let's go from there. So there are a couple of questions. For example, how we compare different ecosystems or decks in this particular case. And there is some mathematical tools that allow you to do that. And they are, well, some of them are actually more than 100 years old. Um, but they are simple mathematical tools that allow you to cluster decks based on their composition similarities. And what I'm saying is that you basically put in the composition of your deck as a sort of table and another deck, another deck, another deck. I'm doing it for 1,000 or 2,000 decks, depending on uh, which color combination I'm, I'm, I'm comparing. And then you sort of input a particular algorithm, 
without boring you with the details, it does the calculation and it sort of spits out which decks are the most similar to each other. So basically, if decks vary by one card, they will be very close to each other. If decks vary by a lot because they have different colors, they will vary quite a lot. Then you can, of course, once you plotted those decks based on similarity, you can assign secondary traits into them. So for example, if I wanted to, I could, for example, see how many two drops does a deck have and see if there's pockets of decks that are similar because they have a lot of two drops in them and how do they do. But I also can actually apply a win rate on them. And this is exactly what I'm doing here. So this is an example of the graph that I was describing to you before. Enter laser pointer. Uh, this is just a blob. 2000 decks from, I don't know, Kaldheim maybe even. It's like a very old graph. I just I just keep it for reference. Uh, so it's basically 2000 decks uh, that I converted into numbers and then use some mathematical trickery to plot them on two dimensional space. But the general trend in there, it's sort of like you have this cloud of dots that are in infinite amount of dimensions and then you just squash them into a flat pancake. And that's why it looks like a flat pancake basically. Um, but the general rule is that is that the closer the two dots are, the, two, the more similar two decks are. So uh, like these two decks that are literally millimeter from each other probably are very similar. While this deck that is on the outskirts and this deck that is on the outskirts on the opposite side will probably be quite different. You can go into deep analysis on, on those things and see these axes don't mean anything. But because I didn't input any kind of information on uh, what the algorithm should look for, but probably there is some uh, difference in there. So for instance, if this would be a, a blob of blue black decks, you probably would find heavily black decks on one side and heavily blue decks on the other side somewhere, or maybe here and here, we don't know exactly. You would have to investigate what, what happens there. Or you would have like decks with the splash here and, and, and decks without the splash here when it looks a bit more dense in, on the plot. So how to get from that blob into something useful? And the trick I do for that is I look at the local win rate. So I basically check the average win rate of each deck and its closest neighbors and I apply it to the plot. So uh, basically here I have two decks, deck A and deck B. And it's 15 closest neighbors, roughly. I mean, it's a fake plot, so you know, don't, don't look into anything. But you can see there's two circles and one red circle shows the 15 closest neighbors of deck A and the yellow circle, circle shows uh, 15 closest neighbors of deck B. Uh, and I calculate the average win rate of, um, of basically both those blobs. So if these four decks that are belonging to the yellow um, uh, deck B, but not deck A, are actually very high win rate, and these are pretty low win rate, the yellow deck will have a much higher average win rate, including the neighbors than the red one, just because of those differences are big between those decks that don't overlap between them. And these decks that are in common don't, don't change anything uh, because, um, well, they are shared by them, so they have the same win rate, basically. Notably, both of these decks are neighbors of each other themselves. So the difference will be mainly from those further related decks, uh, if you have very close dots. Um, and you can do that easily for all the decks on the plot. So, um, this is an example of um, a, a, a doctored plot, basically. And it doesn't mean anything again, but I basically randomly assigned like uh, blue to great decks, um, uh, yellow to very good decks, gray is the medium stuff, and, and red are under performance performers. And they're sort of randomly distributed on the plot. And that's one of the possible scenarios that basically you have the decks and um, well, magic is a game where skill is involved and uh, deck building skills definitely involved, but there's also some luck. So this is a sort of scenario when independently of which deck you would be playing, you'll be either good or bad based on some luck. So there won't be any kind of link between performance and composition. It's a very unlikely scenario, but I guess in some format it might, might happen that, 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 that looks like that. There is another scenario possible. And here we see like a big blob of all those 2000 decks and one blob of the successful decks uh, in the middle of them. And that would mean that there is one general good build and the rest are much worse. Um, and it's possible, depends on which cutoff for good decks you're going to make. Uh, in some scenarios, we might see that 
there is one consensus kind of build that 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 does what the archetype I'm using this term very liberally wants to be doing. And you will find that kind of one uh, one consensus good build and the rest is just traps. Uh, another scenario that's possible is that there are several good builds and they are distinct from each other. So here I have this big plot of 2000 decks and then three uh, uh, blobs of good decks that are quite distant from each other. Again, this is doctor plot. Don't, don't, don't look into it in any detail. Uh, but I think that this is the most likely scenario, that there will be several builds for the deck that can be quite successful. Um, um, right. And here we enter to the magical world of Pekka Kapuli, who helped me to develop a tool for visualizing the data that I get from ecology. And, um, and this will be basically the end of the actual presentation part of it, and the rest of it is just going to be exploring the tool. So... Um, Feel free to explore it on your own, but um, I'm going to show you what's going on in there, and um, and 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 we can we can look at some uh, some archetypes and try to figure out uh, what's going on in there. So I'm just going to remove this. Hopefully, I'll get who not this thing. This thing. There we go. Okay. So here we have the archetypist. Uh, it's archetypist.netlify.app. Um, as you can see, it was developed by Pekka Pulli. He put a lot of time and effort and actually did it quite very well, quite very proficiently. I provided them kindly with the data. And of course, the data comes from 17 lands, as all my data does, because where do you get limited data? Uh, so first of all, uh, we had this tool for a previous set, but um, we are not going to keep old versions probably because of the capacity of this website. Um, so uh, I replaced, well, I mean, Pekka replaced all the um, all the data from uh, Crimson Vow with the data from uh, Kamigawa Neon Dynasty. So we have a couple of, we have one pull down menu and one sort of uh, adjustable um, uh, thing and one uh, filtering tool. So that's very simple in terms of usage. So in the uh, in the pull down menu, you have all the ten archetypes plus four, four color decks, and I'm going to briefly explain to you what 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 what's going on in there. And um, each deck is giving a value of win rate according to uh, its 19 closest neighbors and itself. And uh, here I have a, a, an adjustable thing. I can I can basically look at the top 1% uh, of the decks up to top 50, I think. And as you change it, you also have uh, the blue ones are the good ones and the red ones are the bad ones. Uh, and the number of the bad ones is uh, equal to the number that you assigned here. So if you want to see top 25% decks uh, on the plot, the red ones will be bottom 25%. If you look at the top uh, 10%, the red ones will be bottom 10%. Um, so which decks I did? Because uh, in the previous uh, iteration of it, I just took the 2000 most recent decks uh, from each color pair and I analyzed those. This time I did a bit more uh, filtering. So I took the most recent decks, but I only filtered for complete dr completed drafts. I only looked for players um, at platinum and higher level. Um, yeah, that's basically it. So most of those decks will be from between because archetypes are not played in the very same frequency so most of so all of them are from after 20th of february and um uh, up till 11th of march because that's where i got the data set from uh so it's not this last week basically but uh, it's relatively recent when the uh, metagame should have been more or less stabilized by that time so you look at it and I'm going to go to the 10% because I think that 10% is a sort of decent. Um, no, I don't want it to go there. What happens? Yeah, there we go. Let's go to 10%. Ah, okay. That, that, there, there, there is a bit of um, growing pains on every tool. We have 10%. This is blue white archetype for Kamigawa. And we have those um, uh, clusters of decks. 
So um, these are the top 10% of decks in terms of win rate. We see uh, one cluster here. Uh, we see one big cluster here in the middle. And we see some spots of uh, successful decks here and there, which might or might not be very uh, consistent clusters. It may be just like flukes that they are close together. But we also see clusters of bad decks. So uh, if you see those red dots, they, uh, they, they concentrate here, here, uh, maybe here. Uh, so you might see that there is maybe some areas, some, some builds that are just um, not very good. Uh, but how can we actually use the tool to know what's in those clusters? Oh, by the way, this is a useful thing. If you only want to focus on the decks that are highlighted as the top decks, you can just click this and it zooms into them and removes any decks that are not in that cluster. So it helps you with the analysis. So let's first, let's do that. Let's first look at those top 10% decks. Cool thing, you can just highlight an area and we will do that for, let's say, those two clusters. This is cluster zero, this is cluster one. And when you scroll, you first of all have the average composition um, of the decks. You first of all, you get average win. So these decks have an average win numbers of five. That's converted from the win rate. There's 12 decks in the cluster. So that's the um, upper top left um, uh, cluster. So there's uh, 12 decks in it. That's not a massive cluster, but uh, we can see um, what is the average number of particular cards in that cluster and how does it compare with the average number in the color combination. Um, each dot is a deck. The size of the dot, it means how many games did the deck win. So small dots, Poor decks, uh, middle-sized dots, uh, decent decks, large dots, trophy decks. So that's what we have there. Um, so here we have this cluster of 12 decks. Uh, the top card in them is Spirited Companion at 1.4 copies, which with 12 decks means, you know, they had whatever, 12 times 1.4, you do the math. Uh, it also has Network Disruptor, Moon Circuit Hacker, Golden Tail Disciple, Intercessor Arrest, Prodigy Prototype, and you can see that all those cards are slightly higher than the average for um, for the uh, color combination, especially visible with Spirited Companion, which is probably like it has doubled the amount of uh, of, of Spirited Companions uh, compared to uh, the other decks. You can also see seven like weird cards that maybe you won't expect. Um, it has quite some copies of Seven Tailed Mentor, which seems to be uh, at least a useful common for that kind of build it sees fewer copies of the modern age, which makes me think it's sort of like mid-range tempo-y aggressive version of the blue-white, uh, where you want to get your network disruptor, do some ninjutsu, get some value with spirited companions, uh, win races because you have golden tail dis disciple blocking on, on the ground, or maybe intercessor arrest, uh, removing key attackers. Uh, you are actually not shy of playing wonder intervention, so it's not a... 100% tap out deck. Um, and yeah, you get some uh, uh, vehicles, but not too many, mainly Prodigy, Prodigy's prototype and Brute Suit uh, in those decks. What else you can see in those is uh, look what they have inside. So uh, uh, we have example for, for a couple of trophy decks from, from that cluster. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six trophy decks in there. So you can actually look at the composition of those trophy decks and um, and find what they have in common uh, uh, using your own analysis. So they are, you know, similar, but quite different. Like there is one with two invoke justices and um, eight planes and it still managed to trophy. So kudos to that person. Um, uh, but I think that, yeah, this one is a, probably what it wants to do. So let's say Moth Rider Patrol, Searchlight Companion, Spirited Companion. So, you know, you stack up on those one to three drops. Um, then you have some Blade Blizzard Kitsunas uh, to um, uh, to ninja in with the Moth Rider Patrols and Searchlight Companions or Spirited Companion if you manage. Uh, Cover Technician to do the same. And then you can have, uh, have some uh, uh, play around with that. Um, there's a couple of uh, busted uh, rares in this particular one. There's the Mindlink Mac. Uh, there's the March of the Otherworldly Light, the White March, which is a pretty good card. A Mindlink Mac is the 4 3 crew one uh, that becomes a copy of the creature when, uh, when uh, 
when it becomes crude by it. And there's the reality chip, which, um, what, yeah, the equipment that, uh, that can, uh, well, basically draw you almost infinite cards. Um, okay. So yeah, this is how you use it. And you basically, uh, these numbers um, are showing you the average sort of deck composition, so you can focus on the cards that are most important in the um, in the cluster in terms of um, being shared among decks. Uh, so let's look at the second cluster. What is the difference between it? And here we see that the most predominant cards are Imperial Oath, Modern Age, and this screams to me that this is a control deck that wants to get to six lands as quickly as possible. Has one point five copies of Imperial Oath in it. Um, um, it has some elements of the previous one. So we see Moon Circuit Hacker, Spirit Companion, slightly lower numbers. Um, uh, we see Era of Enlightenment, the most probably, you know, the, the, the most, uh, the, the best uh, defending kind of saga uh, in the format. We have still the Network Disruptor. Uh, we have some suit ups, so you can actually play around with the, um, uh, with the, you know, the dilemma of attacking uh, with the spirit and companion into a 3-3, and then they have to decide, do they have a suit up or do they have a ninja or do they have both? And what do I choose? Blocking and losing my 3-3 to a suit up or not blocking and getting completely outvalued, which is a lovely situation to put your opponent into. Uh, but you can see that this build is very different from the, uh, from the other uh, one. And also you can see there are 71 decks in that cluster and they have an average of 1.5 imperial oath um, um, of imperial oaths per deck, which which brings. I mean, this is a huge number: 71 decks that have an average of 1.5 imperial oath, which makes me th makes me think uh, that uh, well, it's it's an absolutely essential card for that particular archetype. One thing I didn't mention is that I did allow decks with the single coral splash uh, to be showed in, um, in in those two color lists so because I think people splash and you shouldn't ignore that. So that there will be some decks with, 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 with some minor splashes in there. But I kept out the decks that splash two colors or, or three color decks from that uh, category. Um, okay, so let's unfilter it to um, uh, not the top decks only. Um, what I like to do with it is I sort of like to remove the percentage of the top decks that we're analyzing just to see which are the original clusters. And basically we can see that if you go down to 5%, we still see those um, uh, two dominant clusters. So I think that these are the, the sort of two builds for, um, uh, for the blue-white. Uh, the control one and the tempo you one, and that's probably what the color combination wants to be doing. Uh, good part of it is that uh, the algorithms I use to generate those plots, uh, they are agnostic to what cards are doing. They have no idea what they do. So they basically only look at similarity and only look at the win rate data. So I don't have any kind of, I don't introduce any kind of bias to the analysis. Uh, it shows what, what is successful and uh, which uh, successful builds are similar to each other without knowing what the cards do. And they don't know that Imperial Oath is important. They just see that uh, card, that decks that have multiple copies of Imperial Oath are successful because probably that's the reality of things. And it will also show you which cards coexist with that Imperial Oath to make sure that you will be able to get that six mana and custom. And I think that this is all based on best of one. And the, one of the major problems of best of one is that uh, it's not so easy to get the six mana uh, as you would occasionally do in best of three because you don't get those four, five land uh, opening hands. So um, things like modern era are quite reasonable to be used in decks with uh, Imperial Oath because they allow you to scroll through cards much faster and actually get the lands that you're missing to get to the six and once you start casting oaths, you don't need probably a seventh land. Or, and if you do, you can scry to the top, no problem. Uh, but you can get rid of the rest and you stop drawing uh, lands at this uh, magic number of uh, six. And you get like functional deck that gets to the oath quickly. And then once it gets to the oath, it just starts chucking uh, valuable cards rather than getting flooded, which is like a super great combination. Right. Um, so we can move to another archetype. Let's see blue-black. Let's see what we have there. 
So here we have like, again, one big cluster and maybe like two smaller clusters. So let's, uh, let's take a look at what they're doing. First, let's analyze this big cluster. I'm assuming this is ninjas. And then we can look maybe at this and maybe at this. This looks like an interesting, maybe outlier. Let's see if the, this should be like ninjas with some extra value. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I didn't look at those clusters uh, before. So I tried to stay agnostic myself um, before we started the analysis. But okay, cluster zero. So the big one has 1.7 copies of Moon Circuit Hacker in, in the deck, which is again, a lot. Uh, 1.4 copies of Network Disruptor, 1.3 copies of Okiba Reconer Rate, uh, 1.3 copies of Suit Up, which again, shows like people were not super hot on suit up early in the format, then uh, they discovered it uh, later how great it is. Uh, but I think that the data shows this, these are the people that figured it out quite early. Uh, we're basing it on 70 decks. So basically to have a successful ninja deck, you need those multiple uh, hackers, multiple disruptors, multiple Okiba Reconer raid, multiple suit ups and multiple modern ages in one of the other combination. And also the virus beetles are, are there. All these cards are heavily overrepresented. What it also has is, you know, Munzner specialist, the Kuchi, one, one, one of maybe in the deck, that's usually easy to get. Mukotai Ambusher, Silver Fair Master is actually 0.8. This is an uncommon, so having an 0.8 average copy of an uncommon per uh, 70 decks is quite a quite an impressive result. Also like half a copy of Life of Toshiro Mizawa. So one in two decks will have a copy of it. So this is, I think like, because it's averages, of course the rares are not going to show up there very often. Um, but you see the sort of common core of those decks, like sort of like a math generated deck skeleton, which is quite cool to see. So when you draft and you know that these are the priority cards, you know that, okay, I have a choice between multiple commons and I have the Kami of Terrible Secrets and the Network Disruptor. Network Disruptor seems to be much more important for this deck than, um, than Kami of Terrible Secrets. So uh, you'd rather focus on this one. And you know, when you get the late Kami of Terrible Secrets, you're not gonna chase it away, are you? Um, I think what's interesting is that you have also Chlorine Torment. I think that people said that the card is very good in um, Black Red. But it seems it's also very good in um, in the uh, ninja decks, especially because you can target that one particular um, uh, creature with reach or with flying and make sure that your 1-1 uh, uh, flyer goes in and uh, lets you ninjutsu something in. Also, if you play it on the defender 3-3 three, three, uh, green creature, you basically generate a clock at the same time. So uh, that's quite cool, especially if they don't have a way of getting it back to their hand. Uh, what is the second cluster? Second cluster, second cluster, aptly named cluster number one. I just love how data people uh, like to start from zero, uh, creating magnificent confusion in my simple brain. Uh, what do we have here? It's Moon Circuit Hacker, Mukutai Ambusher, Network Disruptor, Modern Age, Suta, Virus, Beetle in slightly different order. Um, and this deck looks like it's slightly more blue. It has fewer Okiba Reconer rates. It definitely has fewer um, uh, Munzner specialist, and you have some removal to uh, to uh, add to the uh, picture, like lethal exploit that didn't show up in the first uh, chapter, and you're already dead that didn't show up. So it's a more like as the other, the first one was sort of like strict ninja. This is more tempo-y build, which has some um, ninjutsu, but less. Uh, fewer enablers for ninjutsu, but um, a very good package of, of letting those small creatures do maximum damage because you remove other things. Uh, what do we have? The cluster number two. Okay, that's a small cluster, so um, it's only seven decks. It's always worth to, work, to look at the average number of wins. Some of those clusters will have like actually a, a, a low average number of wins, uh, and you may say that <clears throat> There is some potential there, but it probably will be dependent on a couple of bombs. And uh, if you don't get the bombs, you will not get into a good deck. Uh, here we are looking at those clusters from a perspective of only top decks. So we skew us a bit to see what's the best in, in this form, in, in this particular cluster. Uh, we'll try to look at them again and I will remove the, uh, the filtering for top decks and then we'll see how it changes the composition. Okay, so here we have uh, 
two Okibo Recon and Raid and two suit ups uh, per deck in those seven decks. So that they seem to be like the most important cards. There is Behold the Unspeakable in quite large amounts. Um, there is Kami of Terrible Secrets, Twisted Embrace, uh, maybe even some Splash because there is Uncharted Havens uh, in, in, in some numbers. This looks to me like a ninja deck that can have an explosive start, but it gives me the signals of um, having something that is a bit more mid-range in there as well. Uh, and probably those mid-range cards are at higher rarity, so you won't see them uh, in sufficient numbers to show up on this particular plot. But maybe you can figure out from um, uh, from uh, from the list. Like here we have uh, Tamio as a splash. Uh, here we have Spirit Sister Call as a splash. Uh, so uh, uh, you see some of those things. Mindling Mac as a as a sort of rare kind of and Satoru Umezawa and Tamashi as a splash probably. So you see that um, all these decks have saw some sort of splash. Um, here we have Ecologist Terrarium, so probably there is some kind of a Splash Plains uh, Tamashi Reality Architect. So these seem to be the blue-black decks with a slight splash that are successful. Um, yeah, so uh, we can find those little things. And here it was this very, very small cluster of only three decks. And um, this looks like Munzner Specialist uh, uh, Tribal. It has two copies per deck on average. Remember, this is based on three decks, so uh, it's, it's, it's a very small uh, sample size. Uh, but interesting to see something different. Uh, but it's, again, a different reconfiguration of the uh, ninja deck, maybe with some more removal than the average ninja deck. Mm. Much better. So we can remove the filtering. And once you remove the filtering, it will add some other decks to those clusters that are also there in, in gray, which becomes a problem because like, for instance, here we take a bunch from here and here that maybe is not so interesting. It would be maybe more interesting if you could draw those borders, but I assume that it would require a much, um, a much more difficult uh, uh, algorithm for it. So now our cluster three, three decks has, on, has seven decks um uh, uh, and, and the win rate dropped uh, by quite a lot it's still quite high though and we still have the uh, moon circuit hacker suit up and moonsner specialist as the as the top top things in there um but for example cluster zero drops to 4.4 win rate but we have 177 decks in there and they have average of 1.5 network disruptor so even though we removed the uh, we added those um less successful decks into them uh, cluster, we still see that the character didn't change because of course those decks are clustering on uh, on, on composition similarity. And this is there, 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 there's probably a lesson in there that, um, you know, you can know the good builds, but not every archetype, not every color pair, you will be able to build a good deck based only on commons. So uh, maybe, you know, those, those decks that are great, maybe less successful, they, they have all the elements at the common, but maybe they 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 miss the uh, secret ingredient uh, that is you know a, a rare here and there. We can also look at the uh, unsuccessful decks. Let's cluster this one. So this is um, uh, an unsuccessful deck, and I think that this is going to be a, a feature that I will um, try to convince. Uh, a Pekka to add in the next iteration of the tool. Uh, I think that the most interesting thing that you will see in those um, unsuccessful clusters, we can also add this one because why not? Oh. Cut. I'll make it a slightly bigger. Um, the most interesting features in those clusters of unsuccessful decks is what's not there. Like here, you see that they have an under average number of network disruptors. Uh, they have under average number of Okiba Reckoner rates. They have under average number of Modern Age. So this seems like these three cards are missing by quite a lot, especially in case of Modern Age. And uh, well, that converts your deck from good to actually quite poor. Uh, and we see the same cards uh, missing in the uh, uh, in the other cluster of poorly performing decks. And here, suit up is missing, for example. So it seems from that data that suit up is actually an essential card for um, 
um, for making your deck tick. But we also see like maybe containment construct. It's not a card for um, uh, for ninja decks, uh, as it here it's overrepresented and those decks perform poorly. Or maybe unnecessary splashes with uncharted heaven. Ha ha haven. Uh, chain flay centipede which is not so great for those decks uh, because this is the card that you want to block and why would you put a card you want uh, that 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 sort of uh, stimulates opponent to uh, block in a deck that um in a deck that uh, wants those creatures not to be blocked basically um and even you know like you attack with the virus beetle and um, if you have suit up it can kill something well, suit up on chain for a centipede just adds to the toughness. It doesn't add any power, which means that opponent already decided that it's fine to get those four damage into that particular creature. So uh, suit up is uh, quite useless. It might, you know, cause your chain for a centipede to survive, but what you want to get is you want it to grow to kill something and also survive on top of that to add like a uh, maximum value. Yeah. So that's another way of, uh, of using the tool. Uh, let's look at the black red decks. Do we see something interesting there? We actually see well, sort of three to four clusters. Uh, we can make four, four clusters, why not? We'll make this one, this one, this one, and this one, let's say. It's very arbitrary how I select those things. The tool is made to explore. Um, and, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be super stringent when you want to explore. Um, we could make mathematical methods of, um, of trying to look at it. Okay, let's start with cluster zero. Cluster zero, black, red. 54 decks, 4.4 wins, which is decent. Oh, no, no, let's remove the, let's remove the, let's only look at the top decks just to get a better impression. So we have boom, 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 17 decks now. Um, it seems Tawashi Song Shaper Virus Beetle, fewer experimental synthesizer than the average for the uh, uh, than the average for the archetype. Um, uh, there's plenty of removal. You see Voltage Surge, Kami Flare, Life of Toshiro, uh, Lethal Exploit. Uh, there is fewer than uh, um, average Oni Cult Anvils in this particular version of the deck. So it's a sort of tempo black red. It has some artifact synergies because it still has the Song Shaper. It has the Virus Beetle, which is a sort of good tempo card because it uh, reduces the resources of your opponent. Um, uh, removal should take care of the early blockers and it's cheap removal as well. So um, you can continue playing your cheap creatures while you still play removal. You have things like Rapid Battery. Actually, this is a deck with probably Chain Flay Centipede is good because it will become a four uh, power uh, attacker and you can remove the blockers for it. So it will either trade with something that costs five mana or it will go in for four, which is uh, seems to be great. So that's at least a, 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 an interesting looking cluster that is slightly different from your average uh, artifact based build. It will still contain a bunch of artifacts because that's what, what the what the color combination has to offer. I mean, black and red has a bunch of artifact, artifacts. Um, okay, cluster one, let's look at where cluster one is. Okay, so these, this is the top one of those two. Um, 16 decks, average win rate, and average wins 4.6. And here we go to more like, you know, synthesizer, simian sling, unstoppable ogre, bunch of only cult anvils, like 1.3, Copies of an uncommon, that's quite a lot. Song Shapers, uh, there's Clawing Torment. So this is the sort of like uh, Sokens and Smelter in abundance as well. Mono Faces Kakazan. Um, so this is your artifact uh, aggressive build where you play creatures, uh, gain some advantage from synthesizers and things. And then if you, if you bring opponent down sufficiently, Clawing Torment and um, Oni Cult Anvil uh, can do the last, you know, five points of damage and, and, and you win like that. And I assume that the other deck is going to be similar. It's just the difference is that it has more virus beetle and fewer synthesizers, but it's the same cards. Uh, this one has fewer only cult anvils uh, significantly. So probably the difference between those clusters is like 
again, the number of only cult anvils that you can have in the deck. Uh, plus, it also doesn't have the uh, smelters, so it's sort of like more aggressive build without that extra reach ability, but probably focusing more on creatures and uh, uh, doing your damage by creating a wide board. Uh, and biggest cluster, 41 decks with 5.1 win rate, so actually very high win rate compared. This one has average of 2 plus uh, synthesizers, so clearly a synthesizer build. And the most important card again, Song Shaper, Iron Apprentice, Simeon Sling. Um, there is also Clank Torments, Kami Flare. So similar to the other deck, but um, I guess uh, uh, more successful because the color pair was more open. So you got more of the essential cards in there. So sometimes, you know, you, you kind of just drag the card by, by hand. You have to rely on what is open. And I think that, um, I think that the tool lets you also um, sort of figure out what can be um, what can be the strategy when you don't open those important cards for your deck so for instance what happens when you don't get only cult anvil uh in your deck uh, in the, in the right amount maybe you want to lean on to build that looks something like that um okay let's look at the bad decks from this uh, color combination or maybe let's let's go down with the percentage uh, uh, filter to see where where are the most successful clusters for the top percent. So you can see that this cluster three was uh, was basically the origin of the successful deck. So probably this is where the money is in, in that archetype. Uh, and these ones are slightly less. The other ones are slightly less successful, but you can still find something interesting in there. Uh, so let's remove those good clusters and try to focus on the bad ones and see which cards are missing from them or which which features are shared among them. So let's take a look at maybe these. Ah, let's go with these two big clusters. We have cluster zero, uh, 2.7 wins, which is you know not terrible, but not great. Uh, synthesizer is missing, basically. Tawashi Song Shaper is missing and Simeon Sling is missing. Um, Cluster 1, 2.6 wins per archetype. Song Shaper is missing. Bunch of only cult anvils. Uh, but um, I guess not enough. So you basically, if I would be venturing a guess in here, it's the people that first picked only cult anvil and tried to force the archetype when it was not open. And, uh, and measuring if it's open is by the number of Tawashi Song Shapers that you get. And, you know, maybe they were just very unlucky and uh, they were not opened in the uh, packs in that pod. But, well, I mean, you, you can see that there are some cards that, are, that seem to be quite essential for the, uh, for the archetype. Also, all these decks played an, an probably unhealthy amount of Undersea Scroungers. You can see there's 1.1 copy when, when other decks were playing, maybe 0.4 or something like that. Maybe even less, 0.3 it looks to me based on those graphs so uh yeah card is not very good and maybe people thought it would be good because it sort of gives that vibe of uh, of a card that would be good i actually thought it might be good before the format was released so i'm not gonna you know throw the stones okay red green modified let's look let, let's look what we can find in here and here we we see that's definitely a tight cluster of successful decks so i'm going to uh, do it slightly separately this is like a bigger cluster we don't know what's inside and and, and another small cluster. So um, so we have uh, three of them. They should be quite similar in compositions, to be fair. So cluster zero looks like the Winnie Anger one because it has um... ah we should remove the no we removed okay. So we have twelve decks, average win rate four point four. Gruel is generally poor in this um, uh, format. We have Fang of Shigeki, Kami's Flare, Hot Spring, and quite high number, Jukai Trainee, um, uh, Jukai Preserver, a uh, couple of big things like uh, Tales of Master Sashiro, Einhub Boar, Blossom Prancer, Bosiju. So it's sort of like uh, we have some small things, then we drop Invigorating Hot Spring, and then we start uh, churning out uh, uh, big things. 
uh, harmonious emergence as well. So it's sort of like survive early game and then start dropping chunk on the board. And it seems to be a mildly successful strategy for uh, for the archetype, I think, especially if you have a couple of higher rarity bombs as well um, uh, to add to it. Then we have the big cluster, and this looks more like um, smaller creatures. So we have the Aki Ember Keeper as the top uh, uh, present common, because probably it's very easy to draft. So some of those cards will be in abundance because they are important. Some of those uh, cards will be in abundance because they are available. And then we have, you know, the small modified things like Simeon Sling, uh, well, Ironhoof Boar and UK Preserver are the bigger ones, but we don't see all the other ones that were uh, so present in the smaller cluster. Uh, we have Coiling Stalker, Jukai Trainee, Unstoppable Ogre, Bronze Blade Boar. These are all two, three drops. So this looks like a more down to uh, ground uh, version of the deck. Um, it has a slightly lower win rate, but actually has a massive sample size. So at least it's interesting to know this is probably the, the you know, the, the, the recipe for, uh, for your uh, red green decks. I assume that, um, uh, they should all have something big um, or something very bomby. Like we see Goro Goro here. Uh, we see um, Thundering Raiju in the other one. Uh, like decent rares that have some kind of synergy with the colors that are played. Um, here we have a bit more of the chunky creatures on, as a top end as well. Uh, with Springleaf Avenger and Greater Tanuki, uh, which probably are very good with Invigorating Hot Springs. Um, yeah, it's quite quite some few trophy decks to screen through, which is also an interesting feature because you can look at those trophy decks uh, without, you know, dredging, um, uh, dredging the internet. And we have the third cluster, the cluster number two, with average of roughly five wins. And here we see the top common is Jukai Preserver, the 4-4-4-4 four, 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 four mana, 3-3 uh, three, three or 4-4 four, four if you put a counter on it, but you can put a counter on something else. Uh, we have some Ninjutsu package and Coiling Stalker and uh, Kappa Tech Wreckers in abundance. Azusa's Mana Journeys, uh, actually heir to the Ancient Fang in this deck uh, seems to be doing okay. Uh, I don't know based on what. Um, that's interesting. It looks like some sort of mid-range with capabilities of having interaction rather than the pure chunk of the first cluster, but it also is pretty successful. So uh, another way of looking at the, uh, what's the name, uh, Gruul archetypes. Uh, honestly, just don't draft Gruul. That's the best. Okay. White, green. And here we have four clear clusters. I'm just gonna do them like this. Try this one, this one, and this small one here. Let's filter top deck so we only see those in composition. Um, cluster zero, 29 decks, 4.7 wins on average. You know, 4.7 wins on average, you get your value back for that kind of result. Oaths everywhere and Spirited Companions, which tells me that uh, White was wide open in that particular pack. And then you have uh, you know, good stuff from Green. It looks pretty, like nothing super exciting, but if you look at the lists, I, as I mentioned, you will see those higher rarity cards that just are not split evenly across all the decks. Because for the algorithm that compares the composition, that's change of one card, um, it doesn't mean that the decks are not similar, but of course, having an AO, uh, the Dawn Sky in your deck will improve its win rate uh, by, by quite a large chunk. It's actually like loads of those decks also have a Go Shintai in them. Uh, well, at least all the, all, the, all the ones from the beginning, the later it stopped uh, appearing. But yeah, again, good to explore. There's a bunch of them. Uh, another cluster, this is a 4.3 win rate, which is still impressive, but um, uh, not as impressive as the first one. This one, top common is the uh, Tales of Master Sashiro. We have Spirit and Companion, Season of Renewal, so we can see that there is a bit of shenanigans with Graveyard. Um, swapping, maybe some channel cards that, uh, that would be useful for that. 
uh, so slightly different, I think more green based than the previous one. The uh, previous one was maybe more white based as the top commons were all white cards. Uh, here we have a smaller cluster, but it has 3.5 win wins, so I'm not going to put too much weight on it. Uh, this is also 3.5 wins. It's, it's a bit of a less successful cluster. They will still pop up, but that doesn't mean that you should, uh, uh, you know, study them in detail. But here we see also some kind of uh, recursion shenanigans in there. Uh, white black, my pet archetype. I really like playing white black here in this format. This is sort of like a grindy, grindy version. Okay, so we see clear like uh, original uh, cluster of solid decks, which makes me think. We should definitely focus on, 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 on that cluster and the other ones are going to be slightly weaker. Yes, these decks are similar in terms of composition, Armoric. They are basically, I computed them uh, and plotted them based on uh, composition similarity. So you can actually assign win rate to, the, uh, to each deck based on the win rate of itself and its closest neighbors. And based on that, you can sort of find clusters where the decks are more successful and try to figure out what makes them more successful. So I think that this is the this is the sort of winning winning cluster here by quite a lot. So let's focus on on this one. It's average five wins, thirty four decks, bunch of imperial oaths, bunch of virus beetles, Kami of terrible secrets, Okiba Recon raid, spirit companion, twisted embrace, which makes me think. If the deck is, if the color combination is open, you can get really amazing decks that have a very high win rate in there, but you need to get those. Uh, I think that these probably, these five cards are going to be so important for the deck. And then, you know, if you get a Naomi on top of it, you should, if it's open on the pod, because um, if th these things are open, then uh, white and black are sort of open. Um, wow, someone really went for 20 lands there. But maybe, maybe that's the way. Maybe that's the way if you have um, Imperials. Oh, they don't even have Imperials. Interesting. But then some decks will probably have three oaths. Yes, indeed they will. Um, well, four oaths. Yeah, that's more my liking. I had oaths in my last five decks, I think. and. Uh, and um, more than one of them trophied. So yeah, that's white, black. Just make sure that the color is open because if you don't get the important cards... Oh, actually, we can see what happens if you don't get the... Or is it because you don't get the important cards? Let's look at this cluster of not so well-performing decks and see what's, what's, what's cooking there. Which cards are missing? Imperial Oath, Okiba Reckoner Raid, and Virus Beetle. So these are the three cards that... Uh, the poor decks just don't have copies of. If you don't have them, you have to think hard whether you want to end up in this deck because maybe you just don't have what it takes for it to win. Black green. Well, obviously this is the most powerful um, color combination in the format. Let's look at the top 5% decks and then and, and see. But you can see here already that there's plenty of clusters of solid things and you can probably do different things based on what they have. So let's make a couple of those clusters. Uh, look at them and see if there's differences between them. So we have from zero to three. What is zero? That's coming of the terrible secrets version. Uh, two copies versus roughly half copy in, uh, on average per archetype. So you basically get into the uh, green red that has plenty of artifacts. And you see that there's also more virus beetles in there that, than in the normal way. There's some searchlight companions. Um, I think we'll, we'll keep that armoric for the for the for the question round uh, because right now I'm 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 barely composed uh, my brain enough to scroll things and not to think about the question because the pause will be just uh, painful to to listen to. Um, here we have a different one. Definitely doesn't have the cami of uh, terrible secrets. So I guess this is going to be more of the uh, enchantment based um, 
uh, version of the deck. So this one will clearly, and, and, and it can be pretty good. Uh, I guess there can be really good decks in that. You have like several trophy trophy lists in there uh, with Kami of Terrible Secrets in some numbers. Oh, actually, one of them even doesn't have, but uh, but two of them do. Uh, this is more like enchantment based, run of the mill with the Tales of Master Sashiro, Okiba Reckon and Raid, Bamboo Grove Archer. Um, you know, you get the good uncommons as well, the Bossy Juice and Blossom Prancers. But no, not an impressive cluster by any stretch of imagination. Here we have a bit of a probably lower to the ground one with a couple of loop potentials for the later game because we don't have those Tales of Master Sashiro. We have Okiba Reckoner Raids and uh, Fangs of Shigeki and then Gloomstreaker uh, Geothermal Kami. Then we don't have like Tales of Master Sashiro as like the top top 10 common in the in the deck. And some, you know, Bamboo Grove, Grove Archer, Greatest Nuki has this channel package and uh, you know, good cards from green and black, and you, you can't go wrong with it. And cluster three, that's the most uh, distinct in its composition. We have virus beetles, geothermal kamis, a um, uh, bunch of removal, bunch of recursion, well, Bosiju because it's it's good in general, whatever. Um, so sort of like more green-based uh, uh, mid-range. And you can see that forests are outnumbering swamps in those decks. Oh, wow, this one even has to behold the unspeakable because why not? Why wouldn't you do that? Uh, so a yeah, slightly different uh, cluster. Mm. And you know, we, we can we can go through all of them, but I don't, well, let's look at the Samurai and the four color cluster because these might be uh, slightly different. Samurai, someone speculated that there'll be just one successful uh, Cluster, but actually, oh, let, let, no, I'm, I might be, I'm, it might be still one cluster. No, no. Actually, there seems to be quite a lot of those clusters from white red decks. Let's see if there's any differences in there. No. I don't know. Just, just, just try it like that because I don't want to make this massive. Oh, let's go with it because I filter by top decks. So let's remove those uh, uh, low win rate things. Let's see. Exam uh, cluster zero, average wins three point six, so nothing impressive. But this is the samurai build. It's a Ganju exemplar, a subdoer, the, the top samurai, Moth Rider Patrol, ancestral katana, Akiron, and Pure Samurai. Like this really wants to do the thing. Basically, this really wants to have the samurai and attack with one creature, and it has. Uh, you know, Tempered in Solitude, uh, Raiju Storm's Age, uh, so all the things that, you know, the what he told us to do. And, you know, you can still make a successful deck out of it, um, but uh, but not super successful. 3.6 wins is, is not enough to pay for the draft, uh, so that's probably not, not the thing. Here we have a cluster one with 4.9 wins over 10, 10 decks. Uh, let's look at cluster one, and that's the one. Let's see what we have in those. Um, so Mercurio Blue is saying that Tempered in Solitude has been pretty nasty wherever I have faced against it. Back, back it up with removal or large creatures. I also had a very painful experiences with um, um, Tempered in Solitude when I was playing against red black decks with a couple of flyers when they could clog the board um, on the ground and start uh, you know chipping in with the one two flyers um and it was a pain because they 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 gained so much stuff that they managed to successfully clog the board and the flyer becomes uh problematic at some stage when they have a lot of mana and also um i found that when I build those soup decks, it's sometimes very difficult to have good answers to multiple flyers. Like I could deal with two, maybe with three, but the fourth one was really a pain. And if they see so many cards, they will get those uh, three, four flyers if they build their decks. So it's sort of like a weird black red skies that I, I was uh, having problems with. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, this is like more good stuff. 
there's still some samurai synergies, but um, we don't see it's not so all in as the first one. We have the Eganjo Exemplar and Moth Rider Patrol as the two commons, but then we have Iron Hoof Boar. We see some Kami Flare Experimental Synthesizer, Kumano Faces Kazakhstan, um, uh, Imperial Oats, even. Uh, so it's sort of like a white mid rangey version when you have some samurai synergies, but also some of those really good cards in, 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 in red and white. Uh, there are some good cards in red and white, so um, you can make that kind of attack. Uh, next cluster Surge, a Ganju Exemplar, Imperial Oath, Peerless Samurai. So, as I said before, this is not uh, decks from the um, week one, these are decks from uh, last two weeks, let's say. So, these are already built after knowing something about the format. Uh, and here we see that this cluster with 5.4 wins on average, which, which is pretty successful. Um, judging by the number of Uncharted Havens, probably some of them are splashing something. but Maybe not even, maybe they just had it for good fixing. Um, yeah, no, they, they look like they had it only for good fixing, but uh, that, that's also fine. Um, this is even more mid-rangey with the uh, uh, voltage surges the top uh, common, which probably is good in removing early threats. You have your Enganjo's exemplars. Again, you can, if if you end up in a situation when an opponent doesn't do anything, that can chip in for those three to six damage. Um, but you have like a top end with Imperial Oaths uh, in quite a large number. Um, you have some grind potential with the Norika Yamazaki, the poet, uh, to get some of those enchantments back. Um, from graveyard to the battlefield, uh, sunblade samurais as well, uh, like something bigger. You probably will be more looking to cast it and only use the cycling ability uh, as the emergency. So I'm 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 playing sunblade samurais in my soup decks, and there there most of the time it's just oh I can gain two life and get my planes for the bloody um, imperial oath on turn five. Fine, I will do that. But here it's probably more like a five mana four four veggie creature that will occasionally save your bacon by being able to fetch a planes. Uh, another cluster, quite similar. Um, this one, it looks way more red in, in color. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight out of the top 10 commons are red and only two are white. So I think that this is like a redder version of it. And you can also see that by not having as many Eganja exemplars and uh, Lots of those decks have more mountains than plains. Not all of them, but but quite a lot of them. <clears throat> it's also not super successful. 4.4 is decent, but you know. And here we have like a full artifact synergy white uh, red deck. And we see like two and a half experimental synthesizer, two Tawashi Song Shapers. And then we see the, you know, Simeon's Links, Voltage Surges. And I think the white is mainly Michiko's Reign of Truth Splash. And maybe a couple of you know quality cards like Spirit of the Companion or here they have Blade Blizzard Kitsune uh, and bunch of patchwork automatons. So it's basically a mono red with splashing white for the cards that you really want to have in those. Uh, and we have the last cluster, lower win rate, and that looks like a bit, bit all over the place, like good qualities, but no no uh, sort of clear theme uh, for that. Just cheap stuff with some top end and tricks. So that's like su probably super aggro, maybe you can call it. Can you really call it super aggro? Tempo? I don't know. I don't want to, you know, drop those terms uh, willy nilly. So it's hard to say, but you have Spirited Companion, Experimental Synthesizer, Kami's Flare, Song Shaper is there, but there's so is Era of Enlightenment, and there's Intercessor of the Rest, and Kumana Faces Kakazan, so uh, Michiko Reign of Truth. Uh, so that's there's actually plenty of enchantments in the build, uh, and yet still it leans on um, uh, some uh, artifact synergies like the Tawashi Song Shaper. So a bit of a hybrid. Like this would be a great deck for Kami of Terrible Secrets, unfortunately, it doesn't exist in those colors. but. 3.9 wins is decent, so uh, there is something in there. You just like put all the good cards that you can get from both colors, and it so happens that white has much better uh, enchantments than artifacts. And the last one we can look at is the four colors, and for this I, I took um, 
for this i took all the decks uh, that had four colors and that included um splashes three color decks with one splash um uh, one color deck with three splashes they all ended up in here so it's like a much more diversified soup and let's go out where where are the, those first clusters and maybe let's focus on those first clusters so we see one here 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 these are the most successful clusters so let's repopulate them with more decks and let's look at this this maybe this maybe this it should be very similar, but let's let's put them separately. I mean, there's for sure a bunch of them uh, uh, based on different colors combinations. So, wow, these. So these are probably white, black with something. So here we have a white, black, blue, red. Okay, white, black, blue, red. Blue, uh, 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 green. Okay, this is five colors, so probably they have a Kami War. Obviously, there is a Kami War in this one. So you will have like a combination of those uh, four or five color decks. They are interesting soups. And probably the patterns here will be much weaker because with five colors, you have so much card diversity that it will be hard to find two decks that are similar. But we will probably find things like Network Terminal and Terrarium being high and o Imperial Oath being quite high. Uh, next cluster, Uncharted Haven, Network Terminal, Season of Renewal, Geothermal Kami. Kami. So this is like a grindy kind of recursion loopy loop deck. Uh, when you have some um, Gloom Shriekers, when you have some Colossal Sky Turtles, uh, Geothermal Kami with um, Gloom Shriekers, you know, a nice combo. You have network terminals uh, because you want to fix your mana and this seems to be like the most important card and I think this is the best tool for fixing in the format and generally point because in some situations we'll win you the games. Uh, here again, Uncharted Haven, Network Terminal, Terrarium, which points to which points you to the fact that you really want to have ways of finding your lands in those type of decks. And Modern Age can be counted as one of those tools as well. And then you need to have this Imperial Oath because this is a way of getting a bomb level card as a common that does exactly what you want to do in your deck because it gives you card selection. In a multicolor deck, card selection is way more worth than the monocolor one because sometimes you are not capable of casting something. You can get the tools to cast it. Sometimes you just ignore the fact that you cannot cast something and just like put it on the bottom and, and focus on cards that you can cast and so on and so on. Uh, it's a low win rate cluster, 3.8. There's nothing super imp imp impressive in those uh, uh, in those high win clusters uh, for four color decks. And I think that this has something to do with um, with the nature of them. They will be very similar in their base, and small differences will be uh, referring to the power of the bombs that you manage to accumulate because you want to play those four colors for a good reason. So for me, those good reasons mean I have a couple of rares and colors that I don't really think are open, but the col but the cards are trivial to splash. So I want to play them anyway, because their only synergy is that they're powerful. And then I just build like piles. And uh, actually I've been quite successful with those in this format. So uh, you can build them. I think that uh, my last two trophy decks were white, blue, black, green in different ratios. and white was in all cases just oaths and summarize for splashing the oaths so uh, that's your white settled it does important things it's trivial to put those oaths and then you know you can have a more tempo -y version of the blue black that i had or maybe more grindy green black uh, as a base but you still can put some blue cards if you have a good bomb there um, or a um, green card if you have something that will add to the functionality of the deck and you sort of as assemble those piles. But um, let's look at the ones that don't work very well in the multicolor department because maybe there we'll find some uh, interesting uh, features, I hope at least. Okay, let's look at this, this, maybe this, maybe this. So cards are missing, Uncharted Haven in here. So again, focus on that fixing. 
Uh, Uncharted Haven again missing. So probably there was a competition. That also might mean that there was competition for those. Um, Grafted Grove seems like slightly worse than other ways of uh, splashing. Here it probably was just like a black green or black something decks that just didn't work very well. And they had this nice base of Okiba Reckoner raids and Kamis. But then in the end, the color was not open enough for them to play properly. So they ended up in this soup, but without the right bombs and uh, the win rate um, tells the story. Do we have, oh, actually, I don't see any of those decks that had rec were really low on network terminal, which probably is a testament to how open the card is. But we do see that um, um, having the wrong combinations of the fixing uh, might hurt your win rate. Hey, Samurai and Imperial Oath combo and they didn't win everything? How is that happening? But okay, I mean, we went through um, at least some of those things, but I think that this tool is the best for uh, self-exploration. Uh, so I would encourage you to uh, go to the Archetypist and uh, play around with it on your own and, and try to figure out. I mean, for example, if you don't get one Archetype, it's like you try to draft it and um, you don't have much success with it. You can just look at this Archetype and, and, and explore those clusters, make your own um, and try to figure out like what is the piece of the puzzle that you're missing? What, what are you not doing well? And obviously the answer to that question may be that you actually are not missing anything in the deck building, but maybe in gameplay and um, maybe the plan for that that exists in your head for playing the deck is just not optimal and, and, and you're losing your win percentages there. So that would be interesting. If you see that your builds are very similar to the ones that are trophying, you might start thinking, okay, maybe I'm just prioritizing things wrongly. Maybe I fire off that removal just a bit too early in a deck that wants to play a very long game. Like this is a very common mistake when you play grindy piles, for example, in my opinion, at least, is that some people, especially when they're used to play aggro and, you know, guilty as charged myself, um, um, maybe you're just firing this removal too early because you're used to playing aggro when you just basically play creature, 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 removal, removal, dead. Um, long game decks, if you fire the removal too early for a creature that is not a serious threat, uh, you might lose the game because they will play something that is a much more serious threat and you don't have a tool to deal with it. So you have to be managing your removal, for example, much better when you play the game the decks that want to play long game. Uh, so you can figure that, uh, uh out, uh, later, but okay. I think on this, I will uh, finish the presentation part. Um, so um, I'll go back to the PowerPoint. Uh, obviously, a big thanks to Pekka who uh, uh, created the tool uh, for visualizing the data. Um, and also huge thanks for the seven, to the 17 Lands team who uh, always supported me and uh, are awesome. And well, basically they supported all of us because we are all using 17 lens data, do we? Um, on top of that, I would like to thank fake Jake Brown for helping me to release this in the podcast form, which will be probably a big pain for listeners for this particular episode. It was mainly exploring interactive graphs, but, uh, well, you can always see that, uh, as a VOD, or I also put those on YouTube. Uh, so. Even if you listen to it and maybe you are a bit lost, it's maybe good to still finish listening. And in the part where we were super lost, um, you can actually watch the video for a couple of seconds and see what was there on the graphs and, and, and get the link this way. And also for the for those of you that listen to it in the form of a podcast, a big thanks to Asescu and Manajanki for providing the music for the intro of the podcast. And with that, I'll see you next week when I will be talking about To Be Declared. Thank you very much and see you next week.